Eu não sou um baiano sem erudição, mas, como septuagenário, vou dizer, eu não digo todos e todas, porque na norma culta em português, o masculino impera sobre o feminino, sem nenhum machismo, não quero ser antipático, segundo a norma culta. Queria agradecer ao, ao ESP por esse convite de coordenar essa primeira mesa redonda do curso, lembrando de um septuagenário, é sempre agradável ver que ainda somos lembrados. Queria parabenizar o ESP, veja, 12ª edição do curso, que o primeiro tinha cerca de 35 alunos, agora com mais de 300 inscritos. Eu acho que o 13º vai ser no Centro Rebouças, e ele já deve estar vendo com o nosso prefeito, o que vai fazer com a EMB, o Interlagos, para levar os cursos futuros. Parabenizar o Calil por ter promovido, no bom sentido, a vinda do ESPE para a Faculdade de Medicina da USP. O ESPE obteve o título de livre docente, provas públicas que eu tive a oportunidade de assistir, belíssimas, logo depois foi admitido docente do Departamento de Clínica Médica na disciplina de, de imunologia. Tive o prazer de participar dessa banca examinadora. Duas vagas, o ESPER foi o primeiro colocado. Interessante, ah, veja que o Calil traz o ESPER, coisa brilhante. O ESPER escolhe a Maria Cândida Dantas como a sua auxiliar administrativa. É uma verdadeira nova versão da quadrilha do Carlos Drummond de Andrade, porque essa tem um final muito feliz, já que há cerca de 15 dias eu participei da banca do exame de qualificação de um aluno de mestrado com material. A altura de doutorado mostrando que aí todos se dão bem, não vai ter um final diferente do original do Drummond. Nós vamos ter uma sessão de uma hora e 40 minutos, aí já, já gastei alguns minutos. Na primeira parte, o professor Donald Francis, médico epidemiologista, que quando estava no, nos Centros de Controle e Prevenção dos Estados Unidos, participou do, dos primeiros trabalhos de identificação do HIV atualmente está numa organização sem fins lucrativos, Global uh, Resources for, uh, for Infectious Diseases, não lucrativa, que promove pesquisas ne nessas áreas. O Calil já anunciou, queria reforçar, que eu vou fazer com o Drauzio, coisas que não estão na, na internet, nem... No, na página eletrônica do curso. É sobre o filme And the Band Played On, que em Porto, no, 93, se eu não me engano, que no Brasil passou com o título de A Vida Continua. Ainda bem que no Brasil a gente muda os títulos, mas os filmes são legendados. Vocês vão ver que o Donald é a figura central ah, nesse filme, não, não percam. Quanto ao Drauzio, que se diz oncologista, para mim ele é um clínico geral, infectologista, sabe é, de tudo, debate tudo. Agora, vou brigar na Wikipédia, porque o Drauzio foi o primeiro residente do Departamento de Medicina Preventiva, e só eu, e o Guilherme infelizmente faleceu, que temos tido a oportunidade de dizer dessa virtude. O primeiro, a gente nunca esquece, foi o primeiro residente do Departamento de Medicina Preventiva. Então, nesse sentido, eu convido o doutor Donald Franz para compor a mesa, e o Drauzio Varela, o, cada um disporá de 30 minutos, e depois teremos o que o tempo permitir,
uma sessão para perguntas e respostas. Então, né, quando dessa oportunidade, eu queria que você se identificasse, dizendo nome, sobrenome, pelo menos nome, e instituição de origem, e cidade também, né, são cinco mil e tantos municípios que o Brasil tem. Então, tá aí. o professor, o doutor Donald Franz, vai nos falar sobre os primeiros steps da epidemia de HIV e, e AIDS. Please speak slowly and cloud. Okay, I know that you master that. Testing, testing, ah, perfect. Thank you very much, Professor Castillo. Um, it is always a pleasure to come to Brazil. I'm sorry that my Portuguese is very bad, and so I will speak in English, um, and uh, I, if you have questions, just interrupt me. Um, I think one knows um, that you're getting older when the title of your talk is history. Um, But this is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, very important for the younger people in this audience. For us older people, it's too late. Uh, but for the younger people, uh, to see such an important epidemic um, being essentially ignored by the world, even though we knew very early that HIV was an extremely dangerous virus, that was very ably transmitted. Um, and so I will use that example for your education not to re be repeated again. And it is not a scientific issue. It is a political issue that um, we have to have um, a, a ability in our academic situations when we discover new dangerous things, to translate that into logical responses. Um, and the interesting thing for me um, is that s some of our responses are very good for dangerous things. For example, fire. Things that happen very quickly. We have a fire department. They come out with their engines, and they put water on the fire, and they took care of it. But if that fire has an incubation period of 10 to 20 years, societies, even today, are almost impossible to come up with a capability of responding. And so AIDS is a perfect example of a slow-moving situation that we have been unable to respond to. That is, the fire department, you could see the fire with an incubation period of 10 years was going to come up. Um, but in our political situations, when you have elected officials or appointed officials who are in the job for two and four and six years, an incubation period of 10 years, they can ignore it. So for the younger people in this audience, be prepared that any of these, as our laboratory capabilities have uh, gotten better and better, We're starting to see things like pollution and HIV and other things, global warming, that have long incubation periods that our society has an extremely difficult time responding to. And it may not be you that is affected by it as much as your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And so that ability to build into society for the future to respond to slow-moving things is a challenge that we older people will leave to you. And unfortunately, we leave not a good um, uh, background and system to deal with it. Um, but that is something that is, to me, one of the most interesting things in government work and public health work is how to make a situation 
that can look as we have this tremendous laboratory ability to understand pollution, to understand HIV, and understand the time it takes to, uh, for the disease and for, the, for fixing it, that that needs to be understood and transmitted back to the funders and the elected officials who actually are the ones who will have to respond, and it is not easy. So with that pessimistic background, <laughs> let me now uh, uh, give you the story of the early years of HIV, where we really had a remarkable amount of laboratory progress and a very difficult uh, political uh, uh, response to it. I'm not sure that's a warning for what I'm going to say. Or... Okay, so I'm going to be historic and look back at the early days of HIV since I was fortunate enough to be right there at the time to, uh, uh, to uh, um, both understand and put it together and then to be frustrated by the lack of response. Did I cover this up? How do I move the next slide? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I got it upside down. I'm going back. <laughs> there we go, sorry. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, as I mentioned, is to take um, the, 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 a picture of the early days of AIDS uh, by uh, looking at one, my personal background in epidemic control at the time, and then when HIV comes and we understand it, um, to look at the, uh, 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 our understanding of where it came from, that it was a primate virus that came into humans, um, and that how human behavior spread it, um, and the resulting re effects of government response uh, that we, for the top part of this, we understand where it came from, we understood the transmission, and very early on, the dangers. This is an extremely dangerous virus, um, but with a long incubation period, as I mentioned, people can go to sleep. But we fortunately had uh, specimens in our freezers that allowed us to put this together at CDC uh, very, very early on um, to understand it completely at a laboratory basis um, and still have the uh, challenges of responding. And, and the result was a huge pandemic around the world that continues to kill uh, people by the millions. And yes, we have positive uh, uh, therapies that are, are somewhat effective, and you will see them, but the epidemic continues to be a very dangerous one um, and continues to spread. Just a quick background for me, that you heard some of this already. I was a, a young physician trained at Northwestern University in Chicago. And then I went into pediatrics because I found I like fast-moving things. Kids move, get better fast and uh, get uh, uh, sicker fast. And I went into infectious diseases. And then ultimately went on to get a doctorate in, um, in virology to really understand um, uh, uh, these uh, bugs. And interestingly, I chose, of all things, I chose a chronic retroviral infection um, at Harvard to do my doctorate which was feline leukemia of cats, which one would think would not be very uh, important for public health. But that's a retroviral disease that causes AIDS in cats, and so I was in the right place at the right time, or maybe the wrong place at the, wrong at the right time. So I, but for you who, in, in, students who are thinking about what you want to do, I did not have a, a plan. Um, I was uh, a downhill skier um, in, uh, uh, in competition in high school and college. And, and my plan was to be an orthopedic surgeon in the mountains of California so I could take care of patients and ski at the same time. Um, but interestingly, uh, at that time, there was a, um, uh, a, with the Vietnam War, essentially all physicians were being drafted into the military and I had a strong stance against that. And, and so people said, why don't you go to CDC in Atlanta for two years, and you spend your two years in the public health service there as military obligation, and then um, I didn't have to get in a fight with the government over Vietnam. Well, 
I didn't, I didn't even spend my two years in, the, um, in my first two years before I was sent off to, uh, to the rest of the world working on a smallpox eradication program in Sudan and India and Bangladesh. And I got such an excitement over uh, being able to stop dangerous viral infections that I never really uh, went back to uh, my clinical medicine as planned. And then went on to uh, um, join the WHO smallpox eradication program. Uh, later, um, got sucked in for the first Ebola outbreak, uh, uh, the, the initial outbreak. And then uh, with CDC, joined the hepatitis division, um, expecting to just to chase um, dangerous virus of hepatitis, not recognizing that this, that's, that we did the study of the hepatitis B vaccine in gay men, and of course, straight away we knew that the HIV epidemic started and we got in there really for the rest of my career. So this is the beginning, uh, this very interesting report in CDC's newsletter called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report in 1981. We got a call from, actually from the same places that we were doing the hepatitis B vaccine, which were gay men in New York and San Francisco, um, where we did the trial. And, um, the, and we got this call, we have this very strange uh, epidemic occurring in gay men. And this is the first outbreak, uh, a report of AIDS in June of 1981 in CDC's weekly report. Um, and that, uh, interestingly, didn't get much uh, publicity. But for those of us who had worked with gay men and knew the ability of them to transmit multiple viruses, we were very, very concerned about the spread of this epidemic. And then relatively rapidly, um, the world moved together to get the, the cause. And uniquely, it was Francoise Ballet, Sinoussi, and, and Jean-Claude Sherman in, uh, in Paris. Uh, they rapidly uh, moved ahead and took their skills, interestingly coming from the retroviral field, and isolated HIV in science in 1983 report. Um, and immediately, uh, uh, we were contacted uh, since I'd worked with uh, this group before, uh, to uh, look at this virus and everyone began growing it and uh, understanding the epidemiology very quickly. And um, some shocking things came very, very quickly. Um, we had the ability with our, with our la large store at CDC of, of blood from gay men from our hepatitis B vaccine studies to go back and look at the uh, infection rate of HIV and we could see that it was very effectively spread where some 70, 80% of our sexually active gay men were infected with HIV. And then we had some early infections in our study. So we had bloods that went back five, eight years. And we could already see that the mortality was very high. And so this is just the initial um, reports uh, that came out of the uh, um, MMWR. And the, the asterisk there at the bottom was when uh, um, Institute Pasteur reports the, the cause of AIDS in 1983. Um, and, and these are just the numbers out of the MMWR where you get 300 um, uh, cases of AIDS and you get 130 deaths or 3,000 cases of AIDS and 2,000 deaths. But what we did look back and found out that essentially all of those 232 people, uh, 239 people in 1981 uh, looked like they were going to die. Um, in the uh, five to 10 years after uh, the cause of AIDS was discovered. So it was a very, very, I had, as I mentioned, worked on Ebola and other dangerous viral infections, but this one truly got our attention um, at CDC um, and the rest of the world. So it was, and then we had the antibody tests uh, that showed uh, the high prevalence of infection and infection rates, and then the worst, as I mentioned, was the high mortality that came from that. So logically, in a public health sense, that you, many of you will go into public health, I suspect, either in an academic sense or in a government sense, and if you see a virus that's killing, approaching 100% of the people that it infects, and it has infected thousands of people, logic would say we should do something to stop the spread. Um, but, it was a unique time in at least the history of the United States, and often, unfortunately, and especially in this situation, the United States 
can end up to be the leader because we had the laboratory ability, we saw all the data in, of the danger of this virus, and so we turned to the uh, political leaders of the United States to begin at least um, at the United States level a national response that would lead to international responses to take care of HIV. But in, in the United States we generally have two large parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Democrat tends to be more liberal and will respond to things. The Republicans are the opposite and do little. Um, and this was the time of Ronald Reagan, um, who was a do-little person at the best, except maybe in movies. Um, but he uh, certainly was not an, a person who would respond to such uh, things, especially if he, could, if he and his staff could see that what they do today will not have an effect for 10 years, if, if CDC is correct. So why should we worry? So this is a government memo written by me uh, at CDC, just to give you an example of the frustration. Um, for the good of the people of this country and the world, we should no longer accept the claims of inadequate funding, and we should, be, we should no longer be content with the trivial resources offered by the, this is by the government to respond to AIDS. Our past and present efforts have been and are far too small, and we can't be proud. It is time to do more. It is time to do what is right. Um, this didn't work either. Um, so um, I was, uh, the back of this is I was requested by CDC for the US, United States government to write the prevention plan um, for AIDS for the United States. Now this uh, uh, is actually about, I'll show you, is about three years later, so it's already deep in the epidemic if it started in 81. I, uh, the plan was completed. Um, it was for, I forgot, 19, 20 million dollars for the United States to uh, set up prevention education plans for high-risk people in the United States and to do additional work on vaccines, etc. Plan was completed and sent to Washington. CDC is in Atlanta, sent it up to Washington for approval. Um, and the response from the Reagan administration for this, the first AIDS prevention plan, really at the worldwide level, is we will not fund it. And literally, the telephone call to me said, look pretty and do as little as possible. Now, I'd been. Uh, uh, with CDC at this time for uh, several years working around the world, uh, eradicating smallpox and the like, and I come back to my own country only to find a government that was not interested in doing anything. So I asked to go back home. Um, I come from California, and obviously it was not going to work, so I went back to California as just a, a strange, I just called my friends and said, could you use someone to help advise on AIDS? And they said, sure. So I went there as the AIDS, CDC AIDS advisor to the state of California, in, uh, one person in one office uh, to try to control AIDS. But it worked uh, relatively well. In the meantime, I wrote this large uh, paper um, that um, is, did we get a copy of that? I'm, I hope I brought a copy. It's somewhere here that there is available the prevention of acquired immunodeficiency in the United States that goes through the background, why it's so dangerous um, in 1987, and it's interesting history at least. Um, and in that, I said HIV is one of the most virulent infections agents ever encountered. And here I was someone who came out of some very dangerous viruses, from smallpox uh, and others, um, but without a sustained prevention uh, effort, AIDS will continue to kill at ever increasing rates um, in the United States and elsewhere. And this now is now, uh, remember the first cases of AIDS in 1981, we're now six years into the epidemic. And this is what's uh, the cases just in the United States um, that have occurred. Um, and that this is on a yearly basis, but if you back this clock backwards and look at the mortality of 30, 40, 39%, um, and if you look back at what happened to those people each year, it ends up to be essentially 100% mortality. Um, uh, from the, as long as, you, if you follow them for a few years. Very, very, very large number of cases and extremely high mortality just in the United States. And then uh, a, 
actually a newspaper reporter named Randy Schultz um, in San Francisco uh, decided that this, we've got to do something more about this, and he wrote this book, and the band played on. Um, I didn't know what, what the name came from originally, but it came from the Titanic. As the ship is sinking, the band is playing on because they, could, they, did, not, they did not have enough prevention in, in the ship, the Titanic, to have enough lifeboats for everybody. So there's nothing they could do. The ship is going down, and the band continued to play. Um, and so he, he, I don't know where he found that, but that was the title of the book. And it literally is a perfect um, description of the AIDS epidemic that everyone kept singing as everyone was dying. Um, well, I responded and said we had to do these things and uh, uh, sent various memos up uh, from uh, Atlanta to uh, uh, the, the Reagan administration. And the Reagan administration had appointed a new director of CDC, who was a very conservative Republican. And um, they said, the Reagan administration told them to fire me. Um, and I got that word. And um, um, I, uh, at this time, now we are up to, uh, here's the mortality rate. Uh, we see a very, very high mortality rate from this very, very bad epidemic. Um, and the book comes out uh, in, 80, uh, in 87. Um, and uh, I uh, had the wisdom of that time of uh, then uh, uh, being asked uh, to, uh, I just said, please send me to California so I can continue my work and continue my writing. And um, carried on and on and eventually retired and wrote this uh, uh, paper that I have brought in here. And it somewhat has it, so hopefully you guys will have copies of it. It was really an education of... Uh, of uh, having seen what happened in AIDS and should never be allowed to repeat itself on another epidemic that you people will be uh, doing in your lives. Um, but it's a, a, a paper that you will hopefully get copies of that really says that uh, how the deadly AIDS policy failure by the highest levels of the US government, um, and this is a personal reflection, uh, to look back at 30 years uh, and learn from our mistakes and not have them repeated in the future. Now that sounds very nice from an academic uh, manuscript form, but it is a far greater challenge that we are all, and especially you and your generation, will be uh, uh, confronted uh, with when uh, you uh, see similar things um, in your time. So lessons are very straightforward. Uh, public health is an incredibly important uh, um, issue for government and for, uh, uh, for communities, um, and they must be required and able to speak the truth uh, of serious epidemic diseases and hopefully have a response from the, uh, uh, the authorities who have budget and policy decisions um, that make these uh, 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 responses to an epidemic successful uh, or not. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure always to come to Brazil, and I wish you all great successes in your futures. Thank you. Thank you very much.